This is the C5 Galaxy as it sits on the tarmac preparing to load two M1 Abrams tanks that will put the airplane to its absolute limit. This aircraft has been eating tanks since Nixon was president, and today it's demonstrating why after 50 years, nothing else can replace it. The Galaxy's nose is not just a cargo door, but the entire front section of the aircraft pivots upward on hinges the size of trash cans. This creates an opening 19 feet wide and 13 feet tall, big enough to swallow a city bus without scraping the paint. The nose section weighs as much as a fully loaded 18-wheeler, held up by hydraulics that operate at the same pressure used to cut through steel. With the ability to fit everything from Minuteman missiles and Apache helicopters, this aircraft can transport just about any piece of equipment the U.S. military has. But having a massive mouth doesn't help if you can't swallow. The cargo floor sits 10 feet off the ground, creating a ramp angle steep enough to make the tanks slide backward. That's because steel treads on aluminum are about as grippy as ice skates on marble. Push too hard up that ramp and 70 tons lurches forward. Not enough power and it slides back into whatever's behind it. To solve this issue, the Galaxy does something most planes cannot do. Using hydraulics that operate the landing gear, the aircraft can kneel in different positions. For loading vehicles through the nose, the main landing gear compresses while the nose gear retracts deeper into its well. The whole aircraft bows forward like it's greeting royalty. This kneeling capability lowers the cargo floor from about 10 feet down to roughly 3 feet off the ground, truck bed height, and significantly reduces the ramp angle. This makes the difference between vehicles scraping their undercarriages on a steep climb and rolling smoothly into the cargo bay. Speaking of routine, look inside this cargo bay and you'll see 121 feet of uninterrupted floor space. The Wright brothers' entire first flight was 13 feet shorter than this cargo hold. The floor is covered with what looks like train tracks every 20 inches, part of the pallet system that's been standard since Vietnam. Between these rails glide 8,336 tie-down rings, each one strong enough to hold a small yacht, and the Galaxy needs every one of them because of this unique design feature. If you look here, you can see airmen actually loading cargo through the front. Vehicles roll into the back and out the front without backing up. During Vietnam, tanks would drive straight through the plane into combat while engines were still running. Today, it just means more efficient loading, but the capability remains. However, the Air Force isn't just chucking things in there like your junk drawer in the kitchen. Doing so would have disastrous effects on stability. That's why the Loadmaster uses this. A tablet running software that calculates the same thing even the Wright brothers worried about, balance. The center of gravity has to stay within a specific range or this plane won't fly properly. Think of it like balancing a pencil on your finger, except the pencil weighs 720,000 pounds and flies at 40,000 feet. Put these tanks two feet too far forward and the nose won't lift on takeoff. Two feet too far back and the pilot loses control. It's a delicate balancing act that begins the moment anything touches the aircraft. As the first Abrams starts its climb, its engine is whining as 70 tons crawls up aluminum. The moment it stops, six airmen attack it with chains rated for 25,000 pounds each. They'll use 40 chains per tank because turbulence can pull nine times gravity. Without all those chains, the tank becomes a wrecking ball. As the second tank loads, the floor bends down six inches. While you certainly don't want this going on in your house, this is supposed to happen. The galaxy's belly is designed to flex like a snake swallowing prey. Those ribs along the walls aren't decoration. They're transferring 280,000 pounds to the wings, spreading all that weight to ensure even distribution. With both tanks secured, the Galaxy nose will lower, closing its mouth on another meal. But the real challenge waits three stories up, where someone has to make this 720,000-pound feast fly across the ocean. Climbing to the cockpit is like climbing to the top of an office building that flies. The cockpit sits this high because when the nose swings open, it has to clear the cargo bay below. Otherwise, the pilots would be hanging upside down like bats. 
From up here, looking through 23 windows that wrap around like a greenhouse, you can finally appreciate why they call this thing a galaxy. It's absolutely massive. Once inside the flight deck, it looks more like a NASA mission control than a modern airliner. That's because while modern planes have gone digital, the Galaxy keeps its analog backups because computers don't care that you're carrying cargo to some of the most remote spots on the planet when they decide to glitch. Inside the cockpit, there are three crew positions, pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer. Because the Galaxy has too many systems for just two people to manage, that engineer sits behind the pilots facing a wall of switches, circuit breakers, and gauges that looks like a 1970s stereo store exploded. The pilot's control yoke looks hilariously small, like steering a cruise ship with a pie plate. But this isn't connected to anything mechanical. Pull back an inch and hydraulics operating at bone-crushing pressure move control surfaces bigger than most people's apartments. The rudder alone is 1,200 square feet. The elevators that control pitch are each the size of a Cessna's entire wing. But here's where it gets interesting. Taxiing this beast requires thinking ahead because the main wheels are 110 feet behind the nose wheel. Imagine driving a car where your back wheels are in your driveway and the neighbor's house across the street. For today's takeoff, they need 8,400 feet of runway. That's 1.6 miles of concrete just to get airborne. The speeds are carefully calculated. At 120 knots, you're committed. Not enough runway left to stop. At 140 knots, the pilot pulls back and prays. At 155 knots, you're finally flying. Barely. The pilot pushes the throttles forward and 172,000 pounds of thrust fight 720,000 pounds of mass. Each engine is drinking 400 gallons per minute. That's filling up your car's tank every two seconds. The acceleration pushes everyone back as the Galaxy reluctantly agrees to move forward. At rotation speed, something weird happens. The nose rises to 13 degrees, but the tail stays on the ground. The plane pivots on its main wheels like a seesaw, nose pointing at heaven while the tail drags. For four seconds that feel like forever, you're balanced on wheels 110 feet behind you, waiting for physics to decide if three quarters of a million pounds should fly. Finally, the wings generate enough lift, about 750,000 pounds worth, to break gravity's grip. The landing gear takes 90 seconds to retract, 28 wheels folding into five separate hiding spots. Once those doors close, the galaxy transforms from ugly duckling to graceful swan. Well, a really big swan that drinks 50,000 pounds of fuel per hour and hauls America's biggest weapons. The climb to cruising altitude takes forever at this weight. The galaxy manages 500 feet per minute. A Cessna climbs faster, but as fuel burns off, performance improves. They're heading for 41,000 feet where the air is thin and the fuel economy improves from terrible to merely bad. Up here, the autopilot takes over and the galaxy flies steadier than human hands could manage. There's actually a crew rest area behind the cockpit with airline seats and bunks. On the 11-hour Atlantic crossing, crews rotate. Sleep while George, pilot slang for autopilot, does the work. But the autopilot is just the tip of the iceberg for the insane engineering making this monster go. Looking at the wings, you'll see four General Electric TF39S engines that have been around since the Beatles were still together. Each engine produces 43,000 pounds of thrust. Multiply that by four and you've got more pushing power than the Space Shuttle's main engines at sea level. But their size isn't the only thing that makes them revolutionary. These were the first high-bypass turbofans on a military aircraft meaning most of the air goes around the engine instead of going through it. Think of it as a jet engine wrapped in a giant fan. The hot part makes 15% of the thrust. The fan makes 85%. This is why the Galaxy can fly 5,000 miles without refueling, despite weighing more than a small building. Speaking of fuel, the Galaxy carries 51,750 gallons in 12 separate tanks. That's enough to fill your car's tank every week for 40 years. As fuel burns, the balance point shifts about 2 inches per hour. The flight engineer becomes a fuel juggler, moving thousands of gallons between tanks to keep the plane balanced. 11 transfer pumps push fuel around like a circulatory system. 
get it wrong and the plane becomes nose heavy or tail heavy. Neither is fun at 40,000 feet. But despite all these massive fuel tanks, the galaxy still needs pit stops at 40,000 feet if it wants to get all the way around the world. That's where this aircraft comes in. The KC-135 is basically a flying gas station that extends a boom and plugs into a receptacle above the cockpit. Fuel flows at 6,000 pounds per minute. During one refueling, the Galaxy can take on 200,000 pounds of fuel, essentially doubling its weight while flying at 400 miles per hour. But keeping the aircraft fueled is the easy part. The hard part is controlling it. The hydraulic system that moves everything operates at pressures that could cut steel. The system uses titanium lines because steel tubes would burst under their own weight during hard turns. There are 1,200 feet of these titanium tubes snaking through the aircraft. Four separate hydraulic systems provide insane redundancy. Lose one, no problem. Lose two, still flying. Lose three, you can still land, though the pilot will need new underwear. And that's where things get really interesting. After 11 hours crossing the Atlantic, the galaxy begins descending toward Poland from 41,000 feet. They've burned 550,000 pounds of fuel. That's 90 tons of weight gone, which completely changes the way the C-5 flies. Landing weight is 540,000 pounds, still heavier than a fully loaded 747, but the Galaxy feels almost sprightly, almost. The approach starts 150 miles out. The Galaxy uses a 5-degree glide slope instead of the normal 3 degrees, coming down steeper because this much mass needs aggressive deceleration. Think of it like sledding down a hill. The heavier you are, the steeper angle you need to stop in time. At normal angles, the Galaxy would need a 15-mile runway approach. At 10 miles out, the landing gear deployment begins. This isn't pushing a button and forgetting about it. 28 wheels in five separate assemblies fight against 250-knot wind to extend. The landing gear door's opening sounds like someone ripping the roof off a barn. The drag immediately slows the plane by 20 knots. It's like throwing a parachute out the window. As the plane begins its approach, the pilot has to think differently because the main gear touches down 110 feet behind the cockpit. The pilot is essentially landing something they can't see. Judging by how the runway looks through the windscreen when the invisible wheels far behind should touch. Crossing the runway threshold at 50 feet, the pilot pulls power and raises the nose. Those 24 main wheels kiss the concrete with 540,000 pounds of greeting. The nose stays airborne. The pilot actually flies it down to the runway rather than letting it drop. It's like doing a wheelie in reverse. The moment all wheels touch, organized chaos erupts. Eight spoiler panels pop up like giant hands catching wind, destroying 40% of the wing's lift instantly. Then comes the Galaxy's signature stopping move thrust reverses deploy. These aren't just metal plates blocking the exhaust. The Galaxy uses cascade-type reversers, where dozens of curved vanes swing into the engine's bypass airflow, redirecting it forward through gill-like openings that appear in the engine nacelles. Picture trying to stop a boat by turning the motor around and gunning it in reverse. That's exactly what's happening here. The reverses redirect about 35% of the engine's thrust forward, creating 60,000 pounds of braking force. You can actually see the effect. Loose debris on the runway gets blown forward past the cockpit windows. The engines scream louder because they're fighting their own thrust, and the whole aircraft shudders as physics battles itself. Without these reversers, the Galaxy would need twice as much runway and the brakes would literally catch fire. Speaking of brakes, the carbon disks are absorbing 160 million foot-pounds of energy, enough to stop a freight train. The brake temperature reaches 2,000 degrees, hot enough to melt aluminum. Cooling fans will run for 45 minutes after landing, sounding like giant hair dryers trying to prevent the wheels from warping. The Galaxy uses 6,000 feet to stop, though everyone prefers 8,000 for comfort. Once parked, the whole loading process reverses. The nose rises again, the Galaxy opening its mouth after a satisfying meal. The plane kneels and those Abrams tanks roll off into Poland, 14 hours after leaving the States. But despite the normal airfield here, the Galaxy doesn't need perfect runways. 
Give it 5,000 feet of reasonably flat dirt and it's happy. It's landed on highways, desert strips, and Arctic ice. While the other cargo planes need perfect conditions, the Galaxy goes where it's needed, when it's needed. Three companies have tried building a replacement. All have failed. That's why the Air Force is spending $10 billion to keep these flying until 2040. New engines, digital cockpits, and strengthened wings. They're rebuilding aircraft older than most of their pilots because nothing else can do what the Galaxy does. When you see that massive nose tilted skyward at an airbase, you're not looking at an airplane. You're looking at a world where distance defines possibility. And the C5 Galaxy makes everywhere next door. Bye for now.